Aloha. <laughs> I figured since our Hawaiian colleagues, Dick Flagg and Jim Sky, were not marching out the colors, maybe I should. <laughs> uh, I'm not from Hawaii. I just got a good deal on Aloha. <laughs> so, anyway. If you can keep your eyes off of that and on the screen. Um, we're going to uh, try to give uh, a little more uh, details about Jupiter radio emission. And uh, so let me begin with that. We'll talk a little bit first about the magnetic field, since that's essential to some of the things that are going on there. Uh, models of the decameter emission features, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what the spectrographs tell us relative to the, what we think is the emission mechanism. And finally, the hypothesis will be uh, taken a little bit farther. At the end, we hope to have questions and answers. Well, if you don't have any questions, we have some questions that we can ask and talk about, but we'd like to hear any questions that, uh, that you have as well. We'll bring up questions that come up often, but we'd also like to hear your questions and see what we can do to answer. But in order to do that, we have to get through this first part a little quicker. So you've seen this slide before a number of times. The blue line represents the, the magnetic field line that goes through Io. And the anticipated, or what we believe to be the emission mechanism usually involves a hollow cone of emission around the magnetic field line close in to Jupiter's atmosphere. This is uh, the atmosphere, or not the atmosphere, this represents the distance of Io and the torus around Jupiter at the distance of Io because of the uh, fact that Io is volcanic, and the volcanic emission sort of gathers at Io's orbit distance. So this is the torus of particles due to the volcanism in Io that are out at the Io orbit. The magnetic field is represented by these lines, the pumpkin-looking lines, uh, and to a good approximation, the field at distances away from Jupiter is like a dipole field, similar to the Earth's magnetic field. So these represent typical magnetic field lines for a dipolar field. The trouble is that Jupiter doesn't have a simple dipolar field. It's much more complex. So the dipolar field is like a bar magnet, uh, slightly tilted, uh, buried inside of Jupiter. But in order to describe a more complex field, you sort of have to imagine taking another bar magnet and sticking it in Jupiter somewhere. And that's what generates what we call quadrupolar moments. Simple dipolar moment, then quadrupolar moments, and you can imagine continuing to put other bar magnets in there, getting higher order moments, octopolar and so forth. So it becomes a mathematical equation to describe the magnetic field. So Jupiter has, rather than a simple dipolar field, which would make the uh, strongest magnetic field around the pole and around the opposite pole, Jupiter has these extra di uh, octopolar, quadrupolar moments <coughs> that cause the maximum magnetic field to be actually away from where the magnetic north pole is, or the magnetic south pole. And I thank Kazu for this particular diagram. Kazu and his students have generated a lot of these great diagrams that help to explain the situation. Anyway, you have to imagine these dots as uh, magnetic field uh, values at a particular level. And according to the strength 
of the magnetic field coming in. Okay, here's the magnetic field coming in this way, coming in this way, coming down this way, coming down this way. As you get closer and closer to Jupiter, magnetic field gets stronger and stronger. And the frequency of emission of the charged particles that spiral around the magnetic field, <coughs> excuse me, is proportional to the field strength. So the closer and closer that you get to Jupiter, the higher frequency that can be emitted. And the <coughs> highest frequency that can be emitted is this 40 megahertz as you get the maximum magnetic field close to the uh, atmosphere of Jupiter. So these charged particles, uh, as they spiral around magnetic field lines and go out along the magnetic field lines, will go uh, down in frequency in terms of what they're emitting. If there's any questions along the way, just ask, because I know this gets a little complicated sometimes. What's the source of the electrons? The source of the electrons are usually where we're talking about the strongest emission, IO-related emissions, and the IO-related <coughs> emissions come from these volcanism, <coughs> excuse me, I'm gonna probably need another, yeah, thank you. Um, so the, the volcanic, volcanic gases that are spewed out get ionized out of IO's orbit, that IO torus. Okay, let me go back for a second here. The charged particles, or the volcanic particles are out here in the Io Taurus. They get ionized by the sun, and then these electrons that come as a result of the ionization go down the magnetic field lines. And on the other side, is it a, a complete circuit? Yes. So it goes both north and south. And the, the, down the, here, the, yes. The currents are in one sense of... Uh, they spiral along the magnetic field line down and close, and then because of the uh, the way, well, this will be explained a little more later, but they mirror down here, and then they come back out again. Go down to the southern hemisphere, mirror, come back out again. Okay? If they're going more directly, and sometimes they're lost as they hit the Jupiter's atmosphere, so-called lost cone. But anyway, that's where they're coming from. <laughs> How much deformation of that magnetic field happens from the solar wind, you know, sort of real-time uh, the buffeting effects? Okay, how much is the magnetosphere compressed or yeah, changed and it bounced around as a result? Of, it, it does happen quite a bit, but it's usually a much larger distance away. If it's a really strong solar wind, it can come into the range of Io, but most of the time that's uh, farther away. As Chuck explained yesterday, this is a very large Atmosphere. So out at a very big distance, that's where the solar wind is interacting. But actually, you should see those magnetic field lines as shells of uh, iron shells, uh, onion uh, layers of uh, magnetic field lines. And the, the, the larger are connected the closer to the pole. And these are only the, the, the outer magnetic field, uh, the magnetic field lines are really uh, uh, modified by the solar wind conditions. So it's only very close to the porch, what we call the polar cap. Uh, uh, that the, the, it's only at that place that uh, the, the solar wind is really acting on the magnetic field. Okay. It's not at this, uh, at this, uh, in this region. What, what that piece is getting at is that uh, there's, these are just the magnetic field lines that go out to the orbit of Io. There are magnetic field lines in closer to the pole that go all the way out here and come back in again. There are magnetic field lines here that go very sh close. So it's a pumpkin or an onion shell kind of thing. And we define the magnetic field lines by how far away they are when they cross the equator. So this is at a distance of about six to with Joey and Rita. Do they rotate with the planet or with? Yes, the, they do. Uh, or with the uh, or They rotate with the planet, and you would find that this donut would tip back and forth because of a 10 degree tilt of the dipole. And as it rotates around, it, it sort of uh, uh, bent or tips towards you and then tips away from you. Uh, this is normally a movie, but we didn't have this set up as a movie. Okay, 
So that L shell is that distance away from Jupiter that the magnetic field line crosses. You know, 8 Jupiter radii or 5.9 Jupiter radii is one that goes through Io's orbit. So these are measures of the magnetic field lines. This uh, is some old data that I pulled out of my dissertation, so it's really old. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is an IO phase CML diagram that you've seen before, the probabilities. Um, and it's tipped upside down here because of the fact that back then we used to do it with IO phase starting at zero up here and going down there. But I wanted to give you something that looked a little more like the CML IO phase that you see in Radio Jupiter Pro. So it's been tipped upside down. Uh, and if you assume a magnetic field line and a hollow cone, as, as like what we showed on the first slide, and model uh, for different cone angles, uh, the angle that we call gamma, um, and figure out that when one side of the cone is pointed towards Earth, uh, you're going to get some emission, and when the other side of the cone is pointed towards Earth, you're going to get some emission, a hollow cone. So you get emission when the two sides of the cone go past you. If you model that with magnetic field models that were created as a result of Voyager's trip past Jupiter, what it measured in those, they created a magnetic field model with all these octopole and quadrupole moments. <coughs> Excuse me. Then, uh, if you make that assumption and then you bury the magnetic uh, cone angle, this is a this is a 90 degree angle, 90 degree down here, uh, 80 degree angle, 70 degree angle, and uh, you make also an assumption about whether or not the cone is filled or the cone is not completely filled. If it's not completely filled according to some assumptions, then it, uh, when it's uh, tipped a certain amount, you're no longer going to receive radiation. So with those model parameters and also an assumption that you have field lines that sort of bleed by 15 degrees, enough assumptions, you can model just about anything. But <laughs> <laughs> in any case, uh, it does show that IOB is in the area where you would receive from one side of the cone. IOA in the area where you would receive from the other side of the cone. But the interesting aspect is that uh, it also covers IOC, which is normally believed to be coming from a cone in the southern hemisphere. If you make these same kind of model calculations in the southern hemisphere, it doesn't work nearly as well. Okay, that's science. That's the way it happens. Okay. Uh, just a few remarks, again, about Voyager data. Voyager had the planetary radio astronomy experiment, which went up to 40 megahertz. And we haven't had very many since then that cover that range. Again, this band was caused by um, interference within the spacecraft. So that's the reason those aren't there. But features such as this, again, the top the maximum magnetic field uh, is what we believe causes this envelope of emission above which you don't see any definitive emission. So you have to really know the magnetic field model to see if it matches what that maximum envelope is. Um, and then these arcs, as they're called, this is raw data from Voyager 2 on July 4th, 1979. It was close into the planet. And it was seeing these arcs, one after another, after another, after another. So we consider that to be an important uh, indicator of what's happening according to uh, this emission hypothesis. I won't go into that much right now, but just to show you that there's a lot of structure there that can be used to determine what is the emission <coughs> mechanism. <coughs> so Juno, the spacecraft that's going to go into orbit around Jupiter about 2017, 
it has, in this case, a radio instrument that's going to go up to 40 megahertz. <coughs> and it also is planning to go very close to the planet. In order to get a good magnetic field model, you have to get in close where there's upper uh, moments, the quadrupolar and octopolar moments can be measured directly before they were inferred from spacecraft that were way out here. By going in very close, you can get a much more accurate magnetic field model, be able to use that in the models. Since Voyager was unencumbered by the effects of our atmosphere, were they able to make field strength measurements and determine uh, total uh, emission power within the various mm. uh, frequencies that radio uh, Jupiter emits from? Yes. Yes. And that was an important aspect of what was being done. Still being used to make those measurements again and again with different models and different. So now I'm going to hand over to Chuck. <coughs> Okay, I just wanted to just to talk a little bit about a little bit more about the emission mechanism because um, a couple of people have asked me, and I I know it's a, it's a, a little bit a little bit complicated, but uh, the, the the basic picture we know is this these moving electrons in the magnetic field, right? So you've got the spiraling electrons, so you you you've got the source of energy there um, as they move. Uh, the electrons moving around, so this is a, the, the ma a magnetic field line. As the electrons are uh, spiraling, so they've got a circular motion and also a parallel motion to the, to the magnetic field line. As they're spiraling, they're emitting energy. And the, the angle of the spiral is called the pitch angle. So how, how is it, how, uh, how spiral is your spiral, right? How fast is the electron moving along the magnetic field line? How stretched out is your uh, is your spiral? And so that emission then is projected outward from the magnetic field line. So not perpendicularly, but, but close to. And so that creates this open cone uh, as opposed to a filled cone uh, of emission. Uh, we've also mentioned these, these mirror points. So uh, uh, electrons, as they <coughs> move down uh, field lines, they get pinched. The field lines are getting closer and closer and closer together as they get closer and closer and closer to the pole. And this pinching uh, slows down the parallel component of, uh, of the velocity of the electron. So it slows down, so it still has a perpendicular component, so it's still circular, but it's getting slower and slower uh, along the magnetic field line, that motion. And this pitch angle and the magnetic field strength, the, 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 the uh, strength of the, of, of the field as it gets closer to the pole, increases, this quantity stays constant. We call that an invariant. And so what happens is, is that the, the, uh, the electron then will reach a point where it's, it's feeling a retarding force, actually, as, it, as it's getting closer and closer to the poles, that pinch, the, there's a force, electric force, that pushes back on the electron. And so it reaches a, a point and then basically bounces back and moves backwards along the field line. So it can do that in both the northern and the southern hemisphere. In some cases, um, the, the electrons survive long enough that they'll bounce between hemispheres. And, and at Earth, we know those are whistlers. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, I, just just briefly, and this, this gets kind of complicated pretty, pretty quickly, is that plasmas are strange animals. So they just, they just work differently than regular matter. So you've got ions, positive particles, and then electrons, and 
there are so many different ways that you can generate waves within a plasma. So the ions can move a little bit, the electrons move a lot, and that motion, moving charged particles, creates an electromagnetic wave, but then just the motion of the plasma itself, you get very low frequency plasma waves. So Voyager and other spacecraft actually measured these plasma waves inside Jupiter's cavity, magnetic cavity. You get certain waves set up by the electrons and the ions. You get different kinds of waves, whether uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the wave is perpendicular to the magnetic field or parallel to the magnetic field. Uh, and certain kinds of waves, called longitudinal waves, then uh, generate what's called X, uh, extraordinary mode, or O, ordinary mode waves, and that is uh, polarized one way, circularly polarized one way or the other. So this K number is the, is the wave number, B is the magnetic field, so you get different modes of emission depending on how the wave is oriented with respect to the magnetic field line. And I, I really just want to give you the impression that it gets really complicated. There's lots of different kinds of waves that can be generated by these, these moving particles. And uh, you can set up these kind of strange looking diagrams where we have frequency on the y-axis and this wave number, you know, the inverse wavelength on the x-axis, and certain parameters of the plasma will not allow a wave to propagate. So if you're below the uh, plasma frequency here, which is, depends on the electron number density, you don't get uh, a wave will not propagate in that plasma. So we call those cutoffs. So Certain frequencies, there is, there's no propagation. So below this dotted line here, you won't get any propagation. And if the electron density changes, then you get certain frequencies will be able to propagate, other frequencies will not be able to propagate. And so as far as we understand at Jupiter, the cyclotron frequency of the electron is just a, a, a larger than the plasma frequency, those are the right conditions where you get these decametric radio waves emitted. And uh, it's, a, it's surprisingly, the, the, the plasma density is really small. It's only five, four, three, six or seven, you know, a few particles per cubic centimeter. And once those, so it is really a cavity that's a, 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 a sort of a plasma cavity that you then can get these electrons can set up sort of, if you think of it, standing waves. So you get resonance in this, this cavity. And once you get a resonant wave in a cavity, what, what happens in resonance? The amplitude gets big, right? So you, you, can, you can generate a, a large amplitude wave. And, uh, and these different modes then will, will, will propagate at, at, where the cavity and the resonance is, are, are set up just right. And generally, the X mode will resonate more easily. Basically, the, the, the wave can grow in amplitude more easily than the O mode. So theory predicts that. And so the X mode waves coming from the northern hemisphere are right hand circularly polarized. X mode waves coming from the southern hemisphere of Jupiter are will be seen as left hand polarized because the magnetic field is reversed down there. So typically we see right hand circularly polarized waves coming from the north, left hand circularly polarized waves coming from the southern hemisphere. But then there are some mixtures. So it's, it's just a very complicated uh, process. And so that's, that's really all I wanted to, 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 to say to you about um, uh, 
uh, you know, a little bit about what we call the, the, the cyclotron maser instability. Uh, let, let me add one more thing. Uh, as Jim Tiemann mentioned, if the waves, uh, sorry, if the electrons that are spiraling down the field lines have a certain pitch angle, meaning if this, this angle of the uh, electron motion is very uh, small relative to the magnetic field line, there will not be a mirror point. Those electrons will just funnel right on through down to the atmosphere of Jupiter. So that creates a loss of certain electrons. And then other <coughs> electrons will be mirrored. And that sets up, so it makes the plasma unstable. Because now you've removed some electrons that were there, and so you have this instability that gets set up. And we think that instability then will allow these waves to get generated and amplified, essentially. So. You, you get this beam, essentially, this, this uh, radiation is beamed, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, like a laser, but now in the radio part of the spectrum, so it's a major mechanism. So you got lots of electrons resonating that then will be amplified in this cavity that allows the emission to be really strong, such that we can receive it uh, with Fairly simple equipment here on Earth. Okay. So Does that have anything to do with the aurora? You can see that it's been uh, yes, the, the, the mechanism by which we, we get auroral emissions too. So you, you know the um, oh, you're talking about the lost yeah. lost electrons. Sure. Yeah. So those electrons that funnel down the field lines will then strike the upper atmosphere and, and cause aurora. So yeah. That's what they say. Yeah. And I showed you that picture yesterday where you saw the little footprints of the of the uh, satellites. So the Io footprint and the Europa footprint. So that's also electrons that are not mirrored and funnel down and hit the upper atmosphere. So I'm going to stop here. And, and uh, Francisco, you want to you want to come up and entertain some questions? We got about ten minutes, I think. I'd like to ask one question. Yeah. Some data that we saw yesterday uh, stimulated uh, thought in my mind that there, there may be essentially packets of electrons rotating in that plasma. And uh, is it possible that the resonances in that plasma interacting with Jupiter's magnetic field causes uh, packets of electrons to be uh, propagated briefly? Causes those uh, whistles, so to speak, and then that's they exactly dissipate, right. They lose energy, disappear, and then starts again. That's exactly right. It's a, such a dynamic process here. You've got to have the right conditions set up, and it may be just brief. And so you get S bursts, which are a hundred times stronger, typically, than L bursts. So they're very short, but um, highly amplified. But then the whole thing may, be, may break down, and it, and it stops, and then it starts again. So you can imagine the, the, the and, and then you got multiple field lines. So we got field line here, and another one here, and another one here, and you've got a mirror point here for one frequency, and a mirror point up here for a different frequency on a different field line, and maybe they're interacting with each other. You know, there's just we don't know really the, the, the fine details of what's going on, but it's certainly got to be something. Like that. That's so just very much like a major. Yeah. Yeah. So we've just put a, a few topics up here. If uh, anything <coughs> sparks your, your interest, that's uh, any topic, just ask. Yeah. I have, I have two things. One about the pitch angle. Do you find that the pitch angle is equally distributed between zero and say ninety? I mean, what's I mean? Do we know what the uh, I think so, right. So you have a, um, uh, at, the, at the equator, uh, let me see if I can get this right. I think there's an there's a even distribution of pitch angles, right. So then once you get here, then you lose certain, some of them, and that creates the instability. Okay. Yeah. The other question I have, which I know we're talking about Jupiter here primarily, but can we see similar things with, say, Saturn or Uranus or Neptune? 
I mean, I know they're not nearly as strong in terms of magnetic field, but do you see similar kinds of radio emissions? Yeah. It would, would it be possible to, to detect those as well? Or not? Since they're so weak. Uh, <coughs> can you take that one? Yeah. Well, I think some, some folks would prefer okay. to Okay, let's <laughs> use the microphone. Yeah, in the case of uh, Saturn, uh, Uranus, and uh, Neptune, <coughs> there is a nation also, but the magnetic field is much weaker than so in the case of uh, Saturn, I don't know if you remember, but I think the highest frequency is about 1.4 megahertz or so. So <clears throat> there were several attempts to detect the emissions here from the Earth. And actually, our group at the University of Florida, uh, I was just beginning working there with the group, uh, did some attempts uh, at a higher frequency. Uh, as you know, the lower frequency doesn't propagate to the terrestrial ionosphere, so we are dealing with somewhere around 5 megahertz or so, and that's the end, pretty much. We receive a lot of interference at that time. So they were several of them, around 5, 10 megahertz, 12 megahertz, to see if they can detect them. Uh, negative results so far. And the voyagers actually got there and determined that the highest frequency uh, for Saturn was about 1.4 megahertz, which is something that we could not receive. Uh, except for somewhere in the southern hemisphere, I think near New Zealand or so, there might be some holes there in which uh, I think uh, uh, they were able to detect some low frequency emissions from, from the galaxy. So, in the case of Uranus and Neptune, I can remember as if Uranus may be something like 700 kilohertz than the maximum frequency. So, no hope of the data and decide to so far away. Okay. So, but, with Cassini passed through uh, the radio sources once and it's exactly the, 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 the same phenomenology that the one we observe at Earth for the same kind of emissions. So it's through that mechanism that it's Fine. Yeah, in the case of Cassini, I think they got very good data because Cassini in orbit there so very good data. But one other thing that you were mentioning there. Yeah, uh, the electrons that are mirror at the mirror point begin spiraling upward, uh, those electrons are actually emitting because they are losing energy there. So they, they are emitting in the cyclotron frequency uh, as they move out. But they may uh, hit some pockets there in which the right conditions to trigger the laser uh, are. So when they reach that one, we get out of the emission that could be espers. Espers are pretty long sometimes, so it means that the uh, nicer mechanism may work for a while. But if we take one of these very simple esters and we stress them and we take a look what is inside of them, and that was something that I remember I came here about 10 years ago, gave a short talk on Jupiter's geometric emission and this the microstructure of the esper. So if you stress the esters where you can actually see the internal oscillations there, the very narrow one, then you can see that uh, there are uh, instances in which the emission goes up and down and goes down and then up and down and goes down. And we interpret that, and I can give you a reference to the paper that we published, as the increase, uh, increasing, the major degree increasing in intensity reaches the maximum and then dies and then a little bit later, another one goes down. And this lasts for just a few milliseconds. So that pretty much uh, accounts for the drift rate. Uh, different measures at different distances will trigger and emit the emission, and then another one is triggered. Uh, one other point I want to mention, too, is that the, uh, the same mechanism works here on the Earth. It's called... Uh, 
auroral kilometric radiation. So uh, Baptiste will talk uh, briefly about that a little bit later, but that's really where the, the, the cyclotron major instability mechanism was, was first developed. It was based on measurements from, from uh, Earth emissions. Yeah, just looking at Saturn, actually there are radio emissions that are from Saturn that are also on the ground. And they are lightning radio emissions. So the radio emissions of Saturn lightning, so you have to have a big uh, antenna, like the, the ETR2 in Ukraine, it's really the, 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 the big fat title yesterday. Uh, from, with that instrument, you can observe the lightning in the radio range from the lightning operating at Saturn. Lightning discharges from Saturn, yeah. you yeah. can observe here on the Earth. Oh, wow. It was a few years ago. It was not a testing measurement, but yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Are Jovian alpha waves detectable here in the same way that so? The alpha waves, uh, we think, are. Uh, so an alpha wave is a wave that propagates down or along a magnetic field line. So my my way of thinking about an alpha N wave is you think of a magnetic field line as a guitar string, you pluck the guitar string. So you disturb the magnetic field line so a wave will propagate down that magnetic field line. We think those alpha N waves between Io and Jupiter happen all the time. And we, we think that's causing some of the structure that we see in the, the spectral the spectrograph. Uh, so the arc-like structure, we think, is, is due to some of these alpha N wave motions. So in that sense, you know, yes, we can we can uh, um, we're, we're we're detecting the the, uh, the the cyclotron resonance emission that's caused by the alpha N waves, but but the, the alpha N waves directly are not observed here. The frequencies, I think, are way too low. No, it's a, it's a local wave. So you have to be on the magnetic field and, um, and measure the magnetic field and see that the local magnetic field is moving around. And this is the It's not the way that is propagating. As for the, the guitar, you, if you measure the, the, the location of the, 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 the string, this is equivalent to the, to the... So you only can do them in situ? Yes. Okay. And then the sound wave, which is created by the string, is the radio wave. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So what we see is the effect of the what we see the effect of the alpha waves because those alpha waves which are propagating this disturbance in the magnetic field uh, are the ones that are actually uh, accelerating the electrons going down there. That's part of the interpretation. And, uh, just one more point: some of these uh, uh, electrons or alpha waves. That propagate from Io to the planet will reflect in the planet and then they go back. Some of them will continue to the southern hemisphere, but others will uh, reflect in the Io torus and they go back there. So it's a very complicated uh, um, pattern generated by the alpha waves. Let's go for just maybe one or two more quick questions because we've got to move on. Uh, are, are there any theorists who consider the, the similarities between uh, these sorts of radiations and radiations from pulsars? Pulsars. Uh, Seems like a lot, of, a lot of similarity. Right. Uh, the radiation from, from pulsars is a little bit different there. But uh, Jupiter behaved like a pulsar in some cases because it has some uh, emission being uh, uh, at a given angle, and when it goes around, it do the same thing. But in the case of uh, pulsars, the radio emission, which is normally called curvature emission, uh, is generated close to the poles of the pulsars. So uh, the electrons are accelerated there by the rotation of the, the pulsar, and they move along magnetic field lines. Uh, they cannot uh, follow spirals because the magnetic field is so intense that pretty much they follow each one of the magnetic field lines. And when they are accelerated by the magnetic field lines, uh, uh, they emit what is called curvature emission. And that's what uh, 
and things like that. So it, mechanisms can be a little bit different. Okay. I think it's been made pretty much a simple combination, uh, which is called uh, normally curvature emission in that case because it follows curve path. One more? Yeah, what is the factors that cause the radio emissions around 40 megahertz and below? What causes that cutoff at 40 megahertz? What is causing Is it the ions that cause it so the waves go through? No, it's the strength of the magnetic field. So when the electrons are spiraling down there, when reaching the, the point there, that's, that's the, the maximum strength of magnetic field. The and uh, I'm not sure if you have the, so the strength of the magnetic field is proportional to the frequency. So uh, when you get the maximum frequency, which is about 39.5, you can actually compute the magnetic field strength there. And that was one of the things that they did at the beginning in the 50s when they first discovered that one. They realized that if the emission is uh, cyclotron, then with the maximum frequency, they can estimate the magnetic field there. But that's what limits the maximum. Yeah. Another way probably of seeing it is that in order to emit the radio waves, the electrons have to be in the vacuum. And once they are in the ionosphere, it's lost. They are just the, the collisions, and they, they, there cannot be any emission. So the, right. the, the higher uh, the higher frequency uh, is is the highest frequency at which there can be emission, and it's just before the emission. The magnetic field gets stronger, but then you get into the atmosphere, and there is no emission from there because you get uh, the, you get the inside of the the Jovian ionosphere and the the, the the atmosphere, so there is no emission there. Okay, we should probably move on. It's a uh, great question, thank you. And um, we can take more questions during the breaks or, or at lunch or something, so please don't hesitate to uh, ask Baptiste or Francisco, Jim, myself, uh, Casamasa here. Uh, any of us could help, uh, uh, hopefully help you uh, with some of this stuff. It's, Certainly not easy for us, even. <laughs>